Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the latest Progressive International Forum. Today's session, we'll be speaking about perspectives on internationalist strategy and foreign policy. I'm joined today by three really incredible guests. I'm, I'm tremendously grateful for their time today. The first is Meredith Tax, who has been a writer and a feminist organizer since the late 1960s. Meredith's most recent book is A Road Unforeseen, Women Fight the Islamic State, which was published in 2016 and a range of other books and publications that, she, that, she, that are you know, riven through her CV, including The Rising of the Women, Feminist Solidarity and Class Conflict, between 1880 and 1917, as well as two novels, Rivington Street and Union Square. She's the co-founder of the International Penn Women's Writers Committee, founding president of Women's World, a global free speech network of feminist writers, and of course, she's a founding member of the Emergency Committee for a job of founding in 2018, and about which we'll be speaking today. And I want to welcome you, Meredith. Welcome some to the to the broadcast. Our second guest today is Aslam Ghana, who is associate professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at the College of Staten Island. She earned degrees in political science and sociology, uh, and she's originally from Turkey. Uh, and her PhD is in sociology from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Her work is on memory, and historicity, political economy, and environment and Outsider Identities, and has been published widely in a wide range of academic journals and edited volumes. Her book, Turkish National, National Identity and Its Outsiders, Memories of State Violence in Darsim, was published by Routledge in June 2017. Her most recent research is on state violence and gender with a focus on the Kurdish women's movement. We welcome you, Aslam, as well. And, and finally, equally excitingly, is uh, our last guest, Debbie Bookchin, who is an author and award-winning investigative journalist who has written for a wide range of publications, including The Atlantic, The New York Times, The New York Review of Books, and numerous other publications. She's the co-editor of The Next Revolution, Popular Assemblies, and The Promise of Direct Democracy, a book of essays on municipalist politics and the future of the left with by her late father, Murray Bookchin. She spent three years as a press secretary for Senator Bernie Sanders when he was first elected to the US Congress, and she joins us now. Welcome. Debbie to the broadcast. So it's really, it's such a pleasure to have you all here and it's a, I'm really, you know, we're all very, very inspired by your work and I'm so lucky to have the opportunity to speak with you about it today. And I thought that we could begin the discussion today by really talking about the uh, Emergency Committee for Rajava, which is of course uh, just, two, just two years old, but uh, comes at an essential time in terms of the, the status of the Rajava project and uh, the evolution of events inside Turkey. So I want to turn it over to you, Debbie, to say a bit about where do you think we are and maybe the foundation of the, of the ECR and um, why you think it's so important that we're having this conversation when we're having it, namely in a time of tremendous uh, upheaval pandemic and uh, historic and unprecedented uh, recession. Why, why do we feel like the work of the, the ERC, uh, ECR rather, is, is so essential at this moment in time? Well, thanks, David. Thanks so much for the kind introduction and for moderating. And thanks to Progressive International for hosting us and to all those listeners out there who are tuning in. And I'm sure many people listening to this forum already know about Rojava, but I'd like to begin just for those who may not by locating Rojava a bit geographically and politically. Rojava consists of a strip of land in Northern Syria running along the Turkish border. It comprises a total land mass about the size of Belgium. And the current population is about 4 million people. Rojava declared autonomy in 2012 after the army of Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad withdrew to fight rebels in other parts of Syria. But its political roots go back well before then, as Aslam will discuss a little in a moment. Since declaring autonomy, Rojava has implemented a unique governance system built on three pillars, feminism, ecology, and radical grassroots democracy pillars that are consciously articulated in direct opposition to the values that permeate societies in most of the rest of the world, patriarchy, capitalism, and the nation state. We began working on Kurdish solidarity back in 2014 in another organization, but we founded the ECR in January 2018, specifically in response to Turkey invading the northwest region of Rojava known as Afrin. Almost overnight, this invasion displaced 200,000 Kurdish people. They fled bombing by the Turkish Air Force, including the shelling of hospitals and water treatment plants, many with just the clothes on their backs, and thousands of them still sleep in open-air refugee camps. 
And the destruction of Akron under Turkish rule has continued since then, month after month, year after year, with Turkish-backed jihadi gangs occupying Turkish homes, looting, raping, kidnapping, and murdering mostly Kurds, but also Yazidis and others in this multi-ethnic region. Turkey's now settling new occupants in Afrin, mostly Arabs from other parts of Syria, in a blatant program of ethnic cleansing. And all of this began and continues with the tacit approval of the US, EU, and other actors on the ground in Syria, including Russia. This fact's particularly outrageous given the enormous sacrifice the Kurds made in the battle against ISIS, where they lost 9,000 of their men and women, along with 2,000 Arab souls to rid the region of the so-called caliphate. Trump's most recent decision to withdraw troops in October 2019 from the Kurdish areas has been equally catastrophic. Turkish-supported militias have now moved into other parts of Rojava, where again, they've displaced tens of thousands of people engaging in atrocities and war crimes. And over and over again, Turkish President Erdogan continues to vow that he'll wipe Rojava off the map, including in speeches before bodies like the UN, which have failed to act in any way whatsoever. So what we basically have is something, something almost like UN-sanctioned ethnic cleansing going on right before our eyes. And the reason of that for this, of course, is that Rojava's democratic feminist society is the polar opposite of what's going on in Turkey and indeed in vast parts of the world right now. As we all are seeing from Orban in Hungary, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Modi in India to Trump in the US, we really re we face a rising tide of fascism unlike anything seen since the 1930s a climate that is now, you know, would be dictators around the world are literally emboldening each other day by day. And it's very alarming. Uh, folks watching this from Europe should know that the US is right now really on the precipice of a, a full blown Giorgio Agamben nightmare, literally as we speak hour by hour, Trump's pressing forward with a grand experiment to see just how fast he can get away with imposing a state of exception. He's sending essentially federal shock troops, like practically a secret police force to pick up people off the street and unmarked vans and detain them and threatening to deploy them in one city after another here in the US. And it really feels right now in many ways like democracy is hanging on by a, a thread. Nothing could stand in greater contrast with this state affairs than the society being built in Rojava. It wasn't really until I spent a few weeks there last year that I could comprehend what a radical transformation has taken place there and just how profoundly democratic and feminist that society is. I think by now, most people know that women serve as co-chairs in every government or administrative position and effectively have 50% of all representation on legislative bodies there. But what I found was a society in which feminism has permeated every aspect of life, in the economy where women run cooperatives or blossoming in every field, from, from sewing to restaurant ownership to agriculture, in education, women are investigating and rewriting their history, examining archeology span and anthropology and all the social sciences and what they call genealogy, which is a social scientific study of women by women. The Women's Umbrella Group, Congrea Star, has created academies where women of all ethnicities are invited to come and live communally for several weeks and talk about their needs and wants and desires and get education they need to become active actors in the social organization of the region. They're essentially unlearning centuries of domination so that they can become active, empowered participants in social and political life. And the last thing I'd like to highlight is the role that radical democracy plays in Rojava society. The, the social organization there, which they call democratic confederalism, it's based on an elaborate, elaborate system of grassroots assembly democracy that starts at the commune level, which can be anywhere from 30 to 200 households in cities 
The commune might be just a couple of blocks in tiny villages. It might be half a village. And it sends delegates who are elected and accountable to the assembly and recallable even up to the next level, which is the neighborhood or village council, which in turn sends delegates to the city or district level and ultimately to the region-wide assemblies, the equivalent of what would be a national assembly for a nation state. And really importantly, alongside these councils, there are committees at every level on health, for example, the environment, defense, women, economy, politics, justice, which anybody in the community can participate in. And, and also significantly parallel to this democratic system of communes and committees, there's an entirely distinct women's structure that is women only committees on each one of those subjects at every level of government in each of the areas I just mentioned. And in any case where there's an issue regarding women, the women's committees can overrule the mixed gender committee. So for example, in the case of reproductive health care for women, women alone make the final decision about rules that govern their bodies. And what I want to, I guess, close in saying is that none of this happened overnight. This work really began decades earlier and included education and struggle over a long period that began with the liberation of women in the Kurdish women's movement in, in Bakur, the southeast region of Turkey, and at which I think Uslam could talk a little bit about. Yes, um, thank you, Debbie, for that um, great introduction of the Rojava revolution, and that speaks for why we stand for and why we defend this revolution and why we started the Emergency Committee of Rojava. I myself am from uh, Baku region. I am from Dersim, which is an Alevi Kurdish um, town, which we, I might come to a little bit later. Um, but it's important to situate the Rojava revolution and it's also important to situate the violence against the Turkish state's attacks against Rojava and what it signified, what it symbolizes for the Kurdish populations. And so Turkish state's attacks against the Rojava revolution was traumatic and at the same time enraging for many of the Kurds who have experienced this violence in different forms, in different places and um, who have had memories of the state violence that were transferred to them, you know, memories of Darsin genocide, memories of Anfal in Iraq, and have struggled to end it. Um, the violence against the Kurdish populations actually dates back to the colonization of the Kurds in the early 20th century, where European powers, at the time it was mainly England and France, decided that an independent Kurdish state would not be in their interest. And since then, Turkey, Iraq, Syria, and Iran, with the complicity of Europe and the US, have massacred, displaced, and tried to assimilate Kurdish populations. But the Kurds are not, have not just been the victims of this violence. They have created a mass freedom movement that have organically analyzed and resisted against the systems of exploitation and oppression. Hence, in this sense, as you said, as Debbie clearly explained, that the revolution in Rojava has a long history dating back to the struggles against colonization of the Kurdish people in the early 20th century, and that took many forms of struggle in many parts of Kurdistan and turned into a Kurdish freedom movement and a Kurdish women's freedom movement within that movement starting in the 1980s with the emergence of the PKK, the Kurdish Workers' Party. And uh, the resistance and resilience of Rojava against ISIS within this history has given hope not only to Kurds, but to all those who were looking for alternatives to global capitalism, to state oppression and patriarchy. And Turkey, like the US, was obviously the opposite of this revolution. It has long been oppressing its populations and it has been the, um, working on the capitalist front and have exerted various forms of state violence against its populations and against women. 
And so Turkey at, real, at first tried to back up ISIS, and there are many um, proofs of this, but realizing that its support for ISIS will not be enough to stop Rojava revolution, um, it started to attack the region openly with its military and air force aligned with the ISIS and other jihad in Russia. Starting in 2016, these attacks became openly done under the name of the Turkish state. And Debbie explained this in 2018, uh, it had invaded Afrin, had ex exterminated the democratic experience that was led by women in that region. So I'm not gonna go in detail there, but I wanna just uh, mention this because this is the context where I started working with the emergency committee for Rojava. Um, because both the Turkish attacks and the international silence, and this is much beyond silence actually, it is cooperation with Turkey to the extent that they continue to have capitalist ties, that they continue to sell armaments to Turkey, and this was outrageous. And also from the perspective of Kurds, this was the repetition of this history of violence against Kurds mm -hmm. that was initiated by the regional empires of Turkey and Iraq and Syria and, um, and, and Iran. And that it has to come to an end at this point. And this silence and this cooperation and complicity in these regimes war against the Kurdish populations have outraged many of us in um, 2018 with the occupation of Afrin and that it continued, as Debbie said, at the UN in September 2019, Erdogan spoke and openly discussed its plans of ethnic cleansing in Rojava, which was then followed by Trump's decision to withdraw the US troops that were only there and that were providing a buffer against the Turkish attacks. And since then, basically, Turkish attacks, feminist side, because we also know that these attacks, they're especially targeting the jihadi forces in the field and the Turkish military forces, have openly attacking the women revolutionaries, women activists in the region. Um, and this feminicide occupation continues without international condemnation. And so ECR, in that sense, does important work to defend Rojava uh, revolution and to practice and spread its principles. And I think I just can't help but say that as we speak, as we're speaking right now, Turkey is attacking Rojava, is attacking Kurds in Iraq, as well as its own Kurdish population, and killing and imprisoning, and the world remains silent. And that is why ECR's Emergency Committee Rojava's interventions have been meaningful, especially in the US where there is a lack of an organized Kurdish community. Um, so Kurdish associations here, such as the American Kurdish Association have not been very active. And also as cultural foundations, they have avoided any systemic critique of the U.S. complicity with Turkey's war against the Kurds. And um, not only the revolutionaries in Rojava were able to stop ISIS, so it was something in the U.S. that could have gained attention from the general public, but they, as Debbie explained clearly, have provided a model of peaceful coexistence among the ethnic and religious groups that have been pitted against each other by regional and international colonial powers for over a century now. And in this sense, the democratic confederalist model practiced in Rojava offers a solution to wars and proxy wars in the region. And ECR continues its support of the Rojava revolution based on feminist, ecological, and democratic confederalist pillars, as well as its continuing work to cultivate solidarity between the leftist, feminist, ecological, and municipalist groups and other movements of the oppressed makes it unique among the organizations that defend the rights of the Kurdish people and the broader principles of the Rojava revolution. So I'm talking a little bit about ECR's work here and why we're discussing it and why I continue to work in this and care about it. 
And um, so our work ethic and practices, and this is also something, you know, to look at the Rojava revolution, but to also try to replicate its ethic and practices in your own organization. So our uh, work ethic and practices have been deeply influenced by the feminist, radical, democratic, and internationalist principles of the Rojava revolution, and also the Kurdish women's freedom movement that has dated um, that was in place even before the Rojava revolution. For example, women have very high representation in the ECR steering committee. We organize panels, reading groups on Kurdish women's movement and feminist principles of Rojava and our decision-making process, organizational structure and cooperation and solidarity with other groups are in line with the Kurdish women's liberation movement that I have followed closely in my work. And especially in the last year, um, I think that we will say a little bit more about ECR's work, but I just wanna say something that I'm part of, I've been part of as part of ECR, that we have focused on building solidarity in this moment, which you know have exposed all the ills with the um, capitalist system and state oppression that goes along with it, racism and colonialism that goes along with global capitalism. So in this sense, we try to understand, um, we try to look into the parallels of the struggles. For example, we have organized discussion groups to understand uh, the parallels of our struggles with the indigenous movements of the Americas, with the Black Lives Matter movement. And we believe that studying this history and the contemporary vision of these movements is crucial for building a collective movement towards an anti-capitalist, anti-racist, anti-patriarchal world. And one of the concrete examples of our solidarity and collective work has been the formation of a coalition um, that ECR uh, founded together with, along with other groups, other organizations, that is called Global Prison Evolutionist Coalition. And um, just want to say that I, we will continue to build upon these feminist, ecological, radical, democratic, and internationalist vision of the Rojava Revolution in continuing to look for collective practices so we can create alternative models um, of global solidarity. So I'll pass it to Debbie now. Well, just briefly to add to um, Oslan's point, you know, one of the one of the things very concretely that we do at ECR is collaborate with people in Rojava. For example, we're working with Rojava University to initiate a program to raise funds for books and equipment. And they would particularly like to connect with scholars in other parts of the world who can do online lectures. And we've done other things like we lent support to the Water for Mesopotamia campaign organized by our fabulous Kurdish solidarity friends in the UK. And some of our members do direct action, for example, in the boycott Turkey campaign. But we really see ourselves largely as an educational and advocacy organization. So while we've had you know, a certain amount of success happily and broader publications like getting op-eds published and letters in the New York Times and the Nation and elsewhere. What our desire is to connect much more with progressives in the U.S. and internationally who we really hope will join us in advocating for Rojava. And, you know, it's understandable that especially here in the United States, people are deeply stressed by COVID and its fallout and also by the critical need to rid ourselves of Trump. And I think partly as a result of that, there's been very little conversation about foreign policy in the current presidential race, for example, remembering of course that the US is already a severely myopic country, but we're urging progressives to bring Rojava into the political conversation. We're asking people to raise the issue with their representatives in the House and Senate and on the campaign trail with Biden. And for those abroad with their leaders in the EU and, and in other influential areas, because Turkey is essentially engaging in a massive ethnic cleansing campaign, labeling every Kurd a terrorist and pressuring populations in the West, you know, to their leaders to turn a blind eye. And we really have to become an active voice against this. I think that that 
in this case, you know, the leadership of places like the United States is really the only chance we have to get to get Turkey to stop its behavior. And I really feel that progressives in particular should be aware of just how precious this model is and how important it is for it to survive. Yeah, and uh, so, you know, we've heard a bit about uh, you know, the, the situation in Rojava now, and as well as its history uh, in terms of dating back not only to 2011, but more recently since 2016, and since the foundation uh, of the Emergency Committee for Rojava, this uh, organization that Meredith, Debbie, and Osley are, are a part. Uh, but I'm, now we can pivot a bit, I think, to the stakes for many of our viewers, for our listeners, about what it would mean to take seriously the question of solidarity with Rojava. Uh, to learn its lessons, to be uh, an ally of the project from abroad. Now, on this very note, uh, Meredith ha Meredith Tax, who's, who's here with us, has, has written a, a very powerful piece for the Progressive International this week uh, towards an internationalist foreign policy that begins to outline some of the directions that we might move in terms of reorienting uh, our, our policies in the countries that are directly in contact with Turkey and indeed with the Rojava project in order to facilitate um, and, and create more room for the kinds of practices that Austin and Debbie laid out. Now, Meredith, your piece begins with a rather radical, uh, I wouldn't call it necessarily pessimistic, but it's certainly an accurate description of where we are, which is that the dam is indeed breaking. Uh, whatever consensus we thought we had before, which was already creaking under the weight of its own contradictions, now appears to have broken open and in the context of this pandemic, as well as the ensuing recession, we're seeing huge questions get tabled in the way that they weren't tabled before. I'm hoping you could start from the beginning here and maybe tell viewers, listeners a bit about what what to you is not only not only what is internationalist foreign policy, but how does your analysis uh, or how do your prescriptions rather flow from your analysis of the present moment uh, and the gravity of the situation we find ourselves in now with these layered crises of Capitalism, indeed, of course, but also health and uh, and the climate as well. Thank you, Dave. Um, yes, I want to pan back now. Now we're going to take a wide angle view to begin with, moving from a close up on Rojava to the whole world, um, because we live in a globalized world, and what happens in one place affects what happens everywhere. And as a world, we've reached a turn in the road. The climate emergency demands that we immediately move to an economy that isn't based on carbon. This will require drastic political and economic change, but the climate crisis isn't the only one we face. The COVID-19 epidemic has already produced almost 15 million cases worldwide and hasn't begun to run its course. The economic depression that's resulting will do millions to poverty, homelessness, and hunger. The coronavirus has also revealed the structural racism and sexism that underlies many of our societies. In the US, for instance, we have discovered that the essential workers turn out to be black and brown doctors, nurses, aides, cleaners, food service workers, who are often immigrants or women, most in non-union jobs earning lousy pay. They can't stay home and be safe because they have to go to work. They go to work and they get attacked by crazed right-wing people who refuse to wear their masks. And the rate at which these essential workers have gotten sick and died has shown a light on the racism embedded in the architecture of this and many other advanced economies. The brutal policing that enforces this racism has taken a terrible toll on human lives, as Black Lives Matter demonstrations on every continent have shown. So we've got climate change, COVID, a vast uprising against police racism and the economic slide. And all these together are putting overwhelming stress on a system that was already at its breaking point. In late capitalism, global economic integration based on free market ideas has led to obscene wealth, as we know for a very few, and desperate poverty for most. Centrist politicians, who have preached reliance on free market solutions and unrestrained growth, were totally unprepared for the crises we now face. Their fixes have always been austerity, privatization, 
further shredding of the social safety net. Their response to climate change has been slow and inadequate, and many haven't strongly opposed the rise of right-wing movements and of these right-wing movements. Decisions that shape today's world are more often made by transnational corporations than by governments or old national elites. Now, some members of the old elites don't like that. They didn't want to give up power and began to support right-wing politicians whose appeal is based on a toxic mixture of racism, religious fundamentalism, war talk, hatred of women and gays, paranoia about cultural dilution by migrants, and with financial and political support from these elites and some religious fundamentalists, a new axis of ultra-right politicians has come to power in various places of the world, including Bolsonaro, Duterte, Erdogan, Johnson, Modi, Netanyahu, Orban, Putin, and Trump. Now, most of these far-right guys are not really that interested in governing. Their main interest is power and they want to steal public assets. In order to do that with impunity, they dismantle the systems that were set up to ensure government accountability. They replace watchdogs with their own people, and they build regimes of cronies, relatives, and party hacks that operate parallel to the state. In Portland, Oregon, as we speak, Trump is using an anonymous, heavily armed force dressed in fatigues with no names, no ID badges, to beat up and arrest peaceful demonstrators and take them away in unmarked vans, reminding many of the dirty war in Argentina. Trump previously used federal prison guards to police a demonstration opposite the White House because he didn't like the city police. He wanted his own private police force. In India, Modi wants to set up a Hindu Rashtra to replace the secular state because he doesn't like its independent judiciary. They make it too hard to steal assets and hand them to cronies who will keep him in power. So what we end up with in this new system is not just the old kind of government with some politicians who are corrupt in it, but a regime that is running parallel to the government and whose whole reason for these parallel regimes result in hollowed out incapable states that have no political legitimacy and no ability to deal with real crises like the coronavirus epidemic. In order to build a base that will keep them in power while they construct these parallel regimes, the right-wing leaders we're talking about target minorities, migrants, women, LGBT people, they invoke religion, they undermine basic democratic rights like voting, assembly, freedom of speech, through constant encouragement of bigotry and persecution and appeals to religion, they attack the very idea of universal human rights. And since they lack the legitimacy that comes from giving real leadership, they can only rule by force, fear, and lies, relying on the military, the police, preachers, and a captive media to build a dam strong enough to contain popular dissent. But the ice cap is melting. Water is rising all over the world, and the dam they have built cannot hold. In the last 10 years, it has developed cracks in one place after another. The Arab Spring revolts, the strikes by the French Gilets Jaunes, the Hong Kong uprising, the ongoing revolutions in Algeria and Sudan, the countrywide demonstrations defending the secular constitution and protecting Muslim women's citizenship in India, and so on and so on. The enormous wave of Black Lives Matter demonstrations in the U.S. has reached even little bitty country towns that are almost all white. And these anti-racist protests have become global. At least for the moment, the dam has well and truly broken. But what happens when a dam breaks? Can the people who own it force the pieces back together or glue them with super glue or band them with iron bands? to make them last? How long can they last? Will the outrushing water overwhelm us all? Or can the water be organized and channeled to irrigate the dry land? We have to find out. We're probably entering a long period of extreme instability and social unrest with many more breaks in the dam due to climate change, subsistence crises, epidemics, 
and local wars leading to increased migration, even if by some miracle we can cut carbon emissions in half in the next 10 years as required, the Arctic ice caps are melting. This will cause a sea level rise of three to six inches. Here's what that means. The collapse of critical ecosystems like the Amazon and the oceans Underwater, large parts of Bangladesh, India, Vietnam, and the Seychelles, cities like Venice, Miami, New Orleans, Jakarta, and Lagos, bigger and better hurricanes every year, devastating whoever they hit, wildfires like the recent ones in California and Australia, and parts of Australia, Africa, the Mediterranean, the Amazon, Central America, and the Southwest U.S. will become deserts, and many cities will run out of water. And all this means that millions of people, won't have any place to live and they won't have enough to eat. So the youngest and strongest will try to leave wherever they are and go somewhere safe. And where are they gonna go? And what are the people who are in the safer parts of the world gonna do to help? Are they gonna try to keep out the migrants and keep everything for themselves? Are they gonna let the people the migrants leave behind starve to death? How can the world organize itself fast enough to mitigate some of these disasters? Current international arrangements are just not strong enough to deal with climate change. They don't have any teeth. Can we build alternatives? Can we do it fast enough? What kind of models can we use? Who will help? The progressive movement has got to get organized and scale up very fast. We know the center has no solutions. We know we can expect nothing but cruelty and obstruction from the right. So here are some of the questions we have to look at. What is our current capacity as progressives compared to the capacity of the right? Oh, not good. How can we improve it? How can we organize in real life during or after the epidemic and decrease our dangerous reliance on the web? Noting the web is subject to hacking and that the Indian state shut it down in Kashmir for a month when it wanted to stop an uprising. So how else can we work? What about the elephant in the room? The question of how the progressive movement should organize itself locally, nationally, globally. Are loose internet dependent networks an adequate alternative to political parties? If not, what kind of parties do we need to build? We haven't united on an answer to this question. And at this stage, which is an interim stage, when we don't actually agree on very much, beyond a very general set of principles and what we are opposed to, the key to moving forward, we think, is to develop actual programs on the ground. We need to test out our ideas and practice as they're doing in Rojava. We need to build unity in the process of doing things that make people's lives better and more secure. We can't do the job by just talking and writing. So what kind of program should we focus on? I can see three main kinds. Climate change organizing and popular education, labor organizing, particularly in the precarious parts of the economy. In the US, labor has been almost wiped out in the last 30, 40 years. And community organizing around a variety of practical issues. Women are critical in all these areas because of our skill set and where we're located in the economy. Historically, women come to the fore in times of scarcity and rapid social change. Sometimes militantly in bread strikes or unemployment riots, sometimes more gradually by developing social programs to improve living conditions like housing and food co-ops, tenant groups, schools, public parks, small scale industries. We have to anticipate that the dam is going to keep breaking in the US, in your country, in ways and places we can't imagine now. We need organizations in place that can keep the water flowing through every breach in the dam, helping each other, hopefully at a manageable rate, until we reach the point when finally, as promised by Dr. King and the prophet Amos, justice will flow down like a river, and righteousness like a mighty stream. Woo, Meredith, well. We've got a lot of questions, a lot of answers, and I'm so excited about the opportunity that we have now to dig even deeper into the more prescriptive elements that flow from this analysis of where we are and the kind of hydra of crises that we're up against. 
uh, as this dam begins to break, forgiving my mixed metaphor there. But I thought it would be helpful if we went point by point through the main prescriptions, and you need to call them that, the, the suggested directions for a strategy for what internationalists might do. Of course, inside the Progressive International, we talk all the time about what internationalism is and should be. And I thought that this piece was so provocative and so helpful in trying to uh, put forward um, a real vision of, of what, it, what, what it might mean to reorient our foreign policies uh, towards a more internationalist direction. So I thought maybe we could start with you, Debbie. We'll bring you back onto the stream. And you could talk a bit about uh, this, this question of assemblies, how we should we make sense of them? And if I can be a bit provocative, just to table it, you know, I think that many people understand conceptually, okay, yeah, assemblies sound good because I believe in a little d democracy. How to make this concept uh, get traction, uh, be politically palatable, and then of course be politically practical. And maybe you could say a bit about, you know, what, why we should be cohering around the demand for popular assemblies and more direct forms of democracy. Thanks so much, David. You know, I think that that's a, a, exactly the question. And, you know, Meredith raises it in this first strategy point uh, in her paper where she talks about the need to build alternative political structures based on direct community participation. And I feel that in some ways that whole idea has sort of fallen by the wayside a bit. And, and that again, one of the things that's helpful is to look at the Kurdish model of a stateless society, because that is really what differentiates Rojava and the Kurdish project in general, in addition to its commitment to feminism, from many national liberation movements, this commitment to creating a stateless society. The Kurds have adopted the position that the state, any state, whether capitalist or socialist, is inherently coercive. States enforce hierarchical structures. They institutionalize various systems of command and obedience, whether they be relationships based on class or gender or age, sexual orientation, ableness, you know, the list goes on and on. And, and even if we could make a completely classless society, it wouldn't necessarily translate into a free society. So instead of seeking a separate Kurdish state, the Kurds of Rojava and of Bakur, the Kurdish region in Southeast Turkey, want to eliminate the state as much as possible by replacing it with this alternative political structure that I described earlier, which is a model that they believe could work for a federated Syria because it would respect all ethnicities and allow for determination on the local level so that power is continuously flowing from the bottom up into a kind of a great confederation of communities, and which we think should be really part of a internationalist program everywhere. Because any left movement that's going to affect a substantial transformation in society has to redefine the very notion of politics. It has to go beyond the voting booth where we walk in, cast a ballot and hope for the best. People have to become empowered decision makers. And that means we have to create forums where people can meet, hopefully face to face again someday, but you know, to discuss and decide issues and then delegate someone from their community who's accountable to the community and recallable and who represents their views, the views of the assembly at the next level, as opposed to making decisions themselves, which is very different from the representative model that we have today in Western democracies. You know, I, I wanted to say my, my father, the social theorist Murray Bookchin, he makes this great observation about the state in, in one of his essays from 1985. And he says, he says, the nation state makes us less than human. It towers over us, cajoles us, disempowers us, bilks us of our substance, humiliates us, and often kills us in its imperialist adventures. We are the nation state's victims, not its constituents, not only physically and psychologically, but also ideologically. And the, the Kurdish leader, Abdullah Jalan, who was a, is a, theoretician and, and who is the real sort of ideological leader of the Kurds in Turkey and also in uh, Rojava, 
really came to share this view in a 2005 declaration. He says, the political root of the democratic nation solution is the democratic confederalism of civil society, which is not state. So what he's saying is that it's really based on the communal unit, what he saw as an ecological, social, and economic construction that doesn't aim to make profit, but rather to meet the collectively determined needs of the people living there. And obviously, you know, we have to get what we can from the state right now. And, and Uslan will talk some more about that kind of inside, outside politics. But I think we also want to emphasize that we have to be simultaneously building a dual power type situation where we form local assemblies in our neighborhoods and communities that can confederate and become ever more powerful and, and increasingly serve as a countervailing power to that of the nation state. And these formations are tremendously important because they allow us to institutionalize a form of democracy that takes us to the next level, you know, beyond a, a mostly defensive politics of protest on the one hand, without on the other hand succumbing to the centralized party discipline model that made so-called actually existing socialism so oppressive. And this is what the Kurds have done and what the radical municipalist movement is trying to do around the world. So this is a main plank of what we feel should be a progressive foreign policy. And, you know, I'm sure many people listening to this forum will know that this idea of building power in popular assemblies, which confederate at the regional and the even national level, isn't something new. It has a very rich history in left politics, from the courtiers of the Paris Commune to anarchist Spain, and to the impulses that drove the general assemblies of Occupy Wall Street. And I think it's important because, you know, past experience shows that too often classic party politics, even those that begin with the best intentions, such as the German Green Party, which formed in the 1980s as a non-party party, and more recently, for example, Syriza in Greece, are too easily sucked into the system where they end up often compromising away much of what they believe. So, just to conclude, we, we feel it's critically important to support movements around the world that are trying to build assembly democracies and, and not to get caught up in debates about which countries are more imperialist than others, you know, not to abandon places like Rojava because of those kinds of debates. And Trump's decision to withdraw U.S. troops from Rojava so that other equally imperialist countries like Russia, Iran, and Turkey can decimate the Kurdish liberation movement is not something we should be cheering about. It, it threatens to destroy a unique example of a non-sectarian, libertarian, socialist experiment, unlike anything we've seen since Spain in 1936, with the exception of the Zapatistas in Chiapas. So, you know, Rojava's destruction, needless to say, is something that would not only revert millions of women back to the status of chattel and be a setback for the entire Middle East, but it would be a setback for progressives everywhere because we need this new model of doing politics to survive. We need to learn from it and to support it. If we can't mount the kind of urgent solidarity necessary to support a truly liberatory new social paradigm like Rojava and the Kurdish freedom movement more broadly, then what exactly are we fighting for? Yeah, I mean, I just think we arrive at a time and, and certainly this project, this Progressive International arrives at a time when when this, imagine, this imagination feels like it's been just eviscerated by years and years uh, not only of the kind of cardinalization and co-optation process, but even when those alternatives do emerge, they're told to kind of stay in their corner. It's very difficult to get those things to proliferate. And one thing that ends up happening is that when these radical ruptures emerge, like, you know, uprisings in various parts of the world, it's difficult then for people to get on board by saying, yep, these popular assemblies are, are worthwhile, you know, as this, exactly as you say, this, this counterweight, because it's very difficult, I think, for people to imagine what is the relationship going to be in the end with the state. 
are we are we determined to just end up like just another political party or are we doomed to be permanently cast off to the margins uh, of the political conversation because we refuse to engage with the state and you know it's really on that on that note, you, you mentioned, Debbie, this, this, this concept of inside, outside relationships with the state, which I think is you know, deeply powerful and also deeply confounding uh, for the kinds of politics, heavily corporatized, mass but cartelized party systems that we live in. So, Aslam, I'm hoping you could say a bit more about, you know, what is this plank of an internationalist foreign policy or indeed just a way of organizing ourselves uh, in any country that any good internationalist should really take heed? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Um, thank you, David. Uh, yes, I mean, as Debbie expressed clearly, the Kurdish Freedom Movement and the Emergency Committee for Rojava is ultimately critical of the state, which holds political power and the monopoly of violence at the expense of people, and especially the outsiders. But, you know, we are also a group that thinks practically, that thinks of strategies and how to do things, how to, you know, uh, hold on to the existing power that we have, but transform them, push them into new directions. And David, as you're saying, most of our imagination is even um, uh, thinks of politics and political models in terms of the nation state model. So the Kurdish freedom movement is quite critical of this. And there is, you know, the democratic confederalist model practiced in Rojava is a product of this critique of the state. Um, but I, we need to think about, as you said, until a stateless, direct democratic model practiced at local and global levels. So we're thinking of a model that is below and above the nation state to come up with different imaginaries and different practices of political governance. But until these are established, which we support, that they need to be established, that our movement is very much in line with trying to um, move bottom-up direct democracy. But until these are established all over the world and globally, the state remains in a quite contradictory position. Because on one hand, the state has historically been in the service of the nationalist ruling elite, and the capitalist class, as Meredith said, has gained even more power in the recent decades in the neoliberal era. But on the other hand, the state has been transformed by struggles of the working class, of the feminist movements, among others, and provided a certain buffer zone against neoliberal capitalism. So the historical struggles over the working day and environmental regulations, the gains such as social security, unemployment benefits, gains of the feminist movements such as the right to abortion have been attacked by conservative neoliberal governments who have pushed for privatization, austerity together with repressive policies against women and other oppressed populations as Meredith uh, clearly explained in her analogy of the dam. Um, so these struggles to participate in and transform local and national government should be recognized and transformed, though, towards a more democratic bottom-up model. For example, you know, to make this more clear, um, in the two contexts that I'm most familiar with, Turkey and the United States, movements continue to shape the state sphere. So there is some room to shape the state sphere while at the same time developing alternative means of politics and self-governance. In Turkey, for example, the HDP, People's Democratic Party, have worked in tandem with independent outside organizations, outside of the state, so they've always worked bottom-up and in solidarity with the leftist and workers' movements. But they also developed a movement broad enough to work inside the state and run campaigns and elect parliamentary candidates. And they succeeded in capturing the local state itself in very heavily Kurdish cities by electing co-mayors and city council members, as in the case of Sur, Cizre, Dersim, and many other places in Bakur, which is in the borders of Turkey. And once they had the state, they began to turn it to social uses like funding women's organizations and renaming place names, for example, that were uh, places that were given Turkish names uh, after the Armenian genocide and after the repression of the Kurds. And they reverted the erasure of this memory. 
They also made sure the financial affairs were honest and transparent and revealed the previous theft by other parties, you know, because HDP was a bottom-up grassroots um, a party, even though it was a political party that, that was working in tandem, so both within and outside of the state. And their local state victories and their success in the local governments made the AKP government in Turkey so upset that they have arrested hundreds of co-mayors and elected officials, and they replaced them with the anti-democratic state-appointed officials called the Kayyus. So while important, the state's fear has vast limitations and is effective as long as the government at least tries to look democratic, which is no longer the case for Turkey. Hence, these strategies about in and outside of the state should we develop depending on the political context and not based on a priori conceptions of uh, what the state or what global politics should look like. In the US, for example, compared to Turkey, there's still, you know, depending on all the um, recent especially um, uh, dictatorship, um, in the US there's still more opening as various movements on racial justice have called for defunding of the police using this funding to support areas such as education and free public education, access to universal health care, which was, um, as you know, abolished in many places around the globe with the austerity governments of neoliberal policies, and as well as in the U.S. reparations claimed within the state sphere reparations for slavery and the systematic structural racism. So though these moments are by no means bounded by the appeals to the state sphere or electric, electoral policies. Um, they eliminate a deeper critique of global capitalism and do have the potential to develop alternative grassroots models like corporations Jackson. So the argument here is that how can you work within the state so to not let go of those gains uh, and to continue to push it so that there is more equality and justice because the states, until we reach out to this grassroots model that's uh, ex you know experimented everywhere, the state has that power. That state sphere um, uh, it, it needs to be pushed to be used in the needs of the oppressed and the women. And um, also similar to this evolution towards a stateless model through the strengthening of the local movements and cooperatives, another area that becomes important where the state is the central actor is international level and international cooperation between the existing nation states to target problems like global warming, occupation and war. But we need to do this, we need to be in support of these within the state uh, through electoral politics models for as long as we are supporting and developing towards more democratic models. So like the local councils, the ultimate objective at the global international level would be the formation of global councils consisting of delegates from regions and peoples with more representation of the colonized and the oppressed. However, as we are working collectively across movements towards global cooperation beyond this nation-state model, we do not have the luxury to remain silent to our government's complicity in wars against the oppressed based on a, a historical and, I would say, isolationist interpretation of anti-imperialism. This interpretation created a very sad and ironic cooperation between some segments of the left and the Trump administration, as Debbie mentioned, when the US troops left Northeast Syria, letting Turkey to commit ethnic cleansing and feminicide. That is the explicit targeting of the women activists in Rojava with the use of European and American technology of warfare. So just taking the troops out does not uh, end this cooperation that the U.S. has with its NATO ally. And this cooperation, the sad, ironic cooperation between segments of the left and Trump, I believe, is actually one of white privilege, which after benefiting from the colonization of the Kurds, 
because we all, you know, living in these countries, you benefit from the century-long colonization and oppression of your country of the others. And they simply think that isolationism, letting the oppressed to the will of the regional empires and dictators, solves global problems. You know, our in and out of state model and the evolution towards the models that are below and above the nation state, creating an imaginary that is stateless. But until then, um, and real anti-imperialism becomes only possible if we create mechanisms of global democratic confederalism. And while we're working towards this end, I would say it's our responsibility to hold governments that claim to represent because that's that reality that we are governed by the nation state model even though we're not happy with it and even though we're aware of the problems with it that it is our responsibility to hold the governments that claim to represent us and whose policies of complicity we benefit from accountable and responsible for the acts of violence that their regional allies commit so this is why it becomes critical to push the state, to change the state, but at the same time to not um, be complicit, to not be silent against the policies that the states are doing on our, uh, on our name. Absolutely, and you know, I think what's interesting is that in both cases, uh, there is there's one was one dimension which I'm hoping that Meredith can can bring into this conversation. We've talked about the importance of organizing locally, the importance of building out local assemblies that can be truly and deeply and directly democratic, as well as using that organized people's power to infiltrate or maintain this inside outside relationship to states that whose power we cannot deny. But there's a strain here that of course the Rajab experience makes clear, which is the importance of, of feminist organizing and uh, connecting with uh, the kind of revolutionary feminism that's, that's emerged out of the Rajab project. Now, I'm hoping that Meredith, you can say, say a bit about this as the kind of third plank of the program that you've outlined. And of course, the, the emergency committee for Ajava is, is, is advocating, uh, you know, really taking seriously uh, not just the practice, but the principle and as well as the broader implications of what it means to organize along these feminist lines. So maybe you could say a bit about, you know, what that means in, in both for the Rajava experience, but also at a more generalizable level. You know, wherever we, we may be sitting, here I am, you know, in Italy and you all in, in New York, what it means to be, um, to, to take those lessons seriously from the experience of revolutionary feminism in Rajala. I would love to. Um, so just first a brief recap, we're proposing a three-point strategy. One is base building in different kinds of organizations, which could lead up to assemblies. The second is an inside-outside approach to the state. And the third is a strategic partnership between progressives and the feminist movement, like the one they have in Rojava. One reason Rojava was able to defeat ISIS when nobody else can, is that they fully integrate women's leadership on every level, from the neighborhood commune to the top military command, and thus they are able to draw on the strength of the whole society. And as people have said, this is part of a long history. Um, it, was, it wasn't easy. The women had to fight to get into this position. Um, that when hundreds of them in the early 90s went to the mountains to join the PKK, they didn't get a warm welcome from most of the male guerrillas. Some of the commanders wanted to send them home. Some wanted to marry them. But the women persisted. And they were encouraged by the PKK's leader, Abdullah Ochilin, to organize autonomous women's military units and play a leading role in the party. And this turned out to be very important because the women's ideas of what should be done turned out to be opposed to the approach favored by some leading commanders. And thus the change that resulted from including autonomous women's units was not only quantitative, but qualitative and resulted in uh, backing away from a purely military reproach, approach and a new line that emphasized community organizing and negotiations with Turkey. So fast forward to Rojava, which Debbie and Aslam have both talked about already. But um, so I'm not going to go over the mechanisms that they described about the ways, uh, the different structural and ideological and programmatic ways that women are brought into 
uh, a position of equality and at the same time maintaining autonomous women's groups and working in mixed groups. But just compare this with the operating system of any progressive organization you have ever been in. Compare the strength and resilience of the movement that beat ISIS with the strength we are going to need in our battle against the global right. And look at the women's movement globally. Now, it's not as strong as it was in the 90s. Who is? It's weaker. It's more NGO-based than the Kurdish women's movement. But it still has enormous strength, as shown by massive Latin American marches against violence and for abortion rights, the leadership of women in places like Sudan, the huge, diverse U U.S. women's resistance movement, uh, exemplified by the work of Black Lives Matter, the rising majority, and the women's marches, all led by women of color. Think how much stronger we could be if this feminist movement and the progressive movement internationally were partners. What stands in the way of such a partnership? Well, a lot. And we have to look at it. We have conservatism and lack of trust on the part of many women's organizations, inspired by decades of mistakes by progressives and left-wing organizations who have ignored or trashed the feminist movement, neglected women's issues, done little or no internal education on patriarchy, and failed to develop women's leadership in their own organizations. Some groups have considered women's issues a minor contradiction that can wait until after the revolution. Many groups proceed on the assumption that women members exist to do the work, to support and carry out the ideas of the male leaders who are, of course, always assumed to be, these ideas are assumed to be everyone's ideas. And unless you have a real democratic organization, you may not ever find out what everybody's real ideas are. Um, and indeed, some progressive organizations have seen the feminist movement as a rival and continually trash it as bourgeois or reformist. And it gets worse. In the last six years alone, three left-wing organizations I could name have had to deal with accusations of rape by men in leadership. One of these groups lost most of its members, and the other two dissolved as a result of the accusations, like this is the way a progressive organization copes with rape to put itself out of existence. We need to rethink this whole thing. We need to think what it would take and what kind of changes would have to go on in the progressive movement itself, as well as the women's movement, in order for them to be able to collaborate and build long-term relationships that could strengthen both. On the side of the women's groups, many of them exist in silos today, all by themselves, separate from other movements, working at the community level on issues like women's health, girls' education, domestic violence. One such group is Planned Parenthood, globally, an embattled global network who's, which runs community-based clinics. These clinics serve the health and reproductive and sex education needs of hundreds of thousands of low-income women and girls, and they have been fighting off attacks from the right for the last 40 years. Now, some of these clinics and other clinics get help sometimes from progressives, including men, who will act as escorts and protect the people going into these clinics from being attacked by right-wing nuts. But surely there are other ways that these partnerships could be developed against the right. I think this is achievable if we can begin to explore it. But a partnership like this has to be based on common work. The kind of problems that come up in terms of race stuff, in terms of sexism stuff, can only be resolved in practice before they're resolved in words. A paper unity based on ideas alone is far too fragile to last. So our movements need to find ways to work together. I think that, you know, as we come to the, the end of the, the session here, I think that that's a great place for us to jump off from. You know, we talked a bit about the U.S. case there in terms of how many of these organizations are grappling with questions of gender or, to your point, Meredith, failing to grapple with questions of gender. I think if, if we were to end with a slightly more, um, not optimistic note, but, but one that is pointing to places where we might, from, from which we might draw inspiration, 
And we've spoken a lot about Rojava. You know, but between Rojava and other parts of the world where we see a kind of feminist internationalism flourishing, maybe each of you could say a bit about, first of all, you know, what feminist internationalism um, means to you and, and what, which kinds of projects you feel like um, might, we, from which we might draw a certain kind of inspiration or, or different kinds of lessons that may be adjacent to overlapping with those of Rajab. And I, I hate to ask, but maybe we can keep remarks to just, just a couple of minutes so we can tr try to keep the time. But I'll start with you, Meredith, since, since I have you. you know, uh, where, where might we look for some inspiration in Rajab and beyond? Well, I think I look to two places. One is history and one is the work that I've done myself. Um, and one thing that comes up again and again in the history of women's work is peace. Um, and the innovation made by the Kurdish women's movement is to couple the desire for peace with the right to self-defense. So you don't go out looking for a war, but you learn to fight, to defend yourself and each other and the societies you're trying to build. And maybe because I live in such a violent country, I see this as a useful innovation. Another persistent theme in the history of women's work is creating alternative social spaces or liberated territories, buildings, plazas, neighborhoods that embody a culture of resistance. And these free spaces become very powerful symbolic, like the Plaza de Mayo in Buenos Aires, where Argentinian women came to demand an accounting for their disappeared children every week. And this kind of alternative space can be built on the community level in schools, settlement houses, after school programs, women's shelters, reproductive rights clinics, tenant groups, food co-ops. The other thing that inspires me is work I did before and after the UN Conference on Women in Beijing in 1995, when women from around the world developed an approach to human rights that insisted the legal framework be applied to women's lives in ways not previously imagined, ways that challenged the old distinction between public and private life like making mass rape during civil conflicts, a war crime, not just a crime against individuals. And these changes were fiercely opposed by some male lawyers, but by insisting that human rights are indivisible and women have the same rights inside the house as they do when they go outside, the feminist movement brought violations like child marriage, mistreatment of widows, domestic violence, and so-called honor killings into the open not to mention the widespread practice of female genital mutilation. And we also dealt with gross inequality and inheritance rights. And since the family is the last fort of traditional male authority, conservatives are really threatened by this kind of thing. They don't want women to have equal inheritance rights or legal rights or protection under the law. They say this is an invasion of privacy. They resist in the name of tradition, religion, defense of the family, defense of life. And in the Global South, conservatives also criticize these ideas as Western imports. Though in fact, like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights itself, this work has been led from the start by women from the Global South. I'm proud to have been part of this movement. And many of the women I worked with in the 90s are still friends, we're in touch and we continue to work together. And I feel like the experience that we all had is a shamefully underutilized resource. Awesome. On, on that note of making use of the resources that, that Meredith has been describing, maybe you could say also a bit about this concept of feminist internationalism that, that might inflect not only our all of our work as activists, but you know, even personally speaking, the work of, of this progressive international as we move from the you know the birth of the organization not so long ago as we expand and grow around the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things I want to emphasize you know this is uh you asked about rojava and what's beyond rojava i see you know people are interested in the self-defense and women's um ypj forces in rojava that defended themselves uh, against not only against um state violence isis violence but against patriarchy and against capitalism that they have developed a consciousness um against all these forms of oppressive and exploitative systems in power. So um, I want to say, you know, how did this come about is it has, as we've been emphasizing from the beginning, that it has a long history uh, of Kurdish women's freedom movement that has deeply inspired me. Um, and that uh, also growing up in part of 
Turkey, which was an ethnic and religious minority and had a long-lived leftist and guerrilla movements that have found refuge in the mountains of this town, it is very interesting that this little locale has a lot um, to say about internationalism or about, um, you know, fighting and fighting for each other's causes for a more just world. And, you know, because of this minority situation and the continuing of Armenian genocide, the memories of the 1930s, a big episode of massacre, uh, genocidal project against the Kurdish populations in 1938 and this part of the world that's uh, of Turkey that's called Dersim, um, has created this outsider consciousness that I have found in my interviews and in my research with the people here that they are very supportive of um, uh, you know, black struggles or feminist struggles. But at the same time, you know, it comes with its own contradictions. For example, as a child growing up there, even though our community was um, uh, represented to be a more egalitarian community, that there was still continuing violence against women, both within the family and obviously by the Turkish state, because um, in 1990s, especially, when the war between the PKK and the Turkish state intensified, the Turkish state used this war against the PKK also against women, for example, with female guerrilla bodies used as sites of domination and colonization. But, you know, it's very um, crucial for me to see this dialectics of oppression and oppression of the Kurdish women, which were in the bottom of the uh, Turkish colonizer society, and they are uh, Kurdish women's freedom movement that became um, such a strong movement that fought against not only the Turkish state's repression, but also have theorized, have developed practices um, so that they can fight against patriarchal structures within their own movements, as well as the patriarchy that capitalist societies have pushed into onto the top of women's bodies. And their resistance in that sense, the resistance in Rojava dates back very much to the Kurdish freedom movement. And for example, some of the people that I draw inspiration from and that have written and that have practiced tremendously this form of um, a women's liberation, not just for women's rights, but for a free and just society for all. So they have believed earlier on, um, uh, unlike some of the tenets within, for example, US feminism, that women's rights alone within a capitalist society is not going to be adequate for them. So they fought um, simultaneously against patriarchy within their own movements, they fought against capitalism and state oppression at the same time. And I have to say their resilience is a very big inspiration. And they have gained many rights through the struggles within their own movement. For example, in 1995, um, the PKK declared that the women's revolution, if you know, I may quote, it says the potential of women who make up half of our society in the service of the revolution and their hidden and suppressed talents and intelligence in creating an entire society based on equality is the most humane and the most radical characteristic of our revolution. So this uh, fighting together, fighting alongside women, but at the same time developing, and this is important, I believe, for the Progressive International as well, that to, pro to develop alternate and uh, women all confederations, women all practices, so that women can find those safe spaces, which then can make interventions into the general body of all gendered bodies, such as practiced in Rojava Revolution and long before in the Kurdish women's movement. I just want to end with a note so that, you know, those of you who are watching this are also aware that because of Kurdish women's struggle against patriarchy, capitalism, and oppressive state structures, they have been the target of a feminicide, that Turkish state's oppression of the Kurdish population have been especially extreme on women. For example, Sakine Jansız, one of the founders who has been active, who was active in the Kurdish movement from its early foundations in the late 1970s, was murdered in the middle of Paris. 
um, by um, you know Turkish forces. And at the same time, many, many Kurdish revolutionaries who have struggled against these structures, such as Gülten Kışanak um, and Figen Yüksekta, so whom a lot of the women within the Kurdish liberation movement that I draw inspiration from are unfortunately in Turkish prisons. They've been sentenced to 14, 15 years of prison for supporting terrorism because they symbolize a resistance that is the opposite of what these oppressive regimes have stood for in India, in the US, in Turkey, what you know the regimes, the patriarchy, capitalism, and oppressive state structures. And these women have symbolized a resistance and resilience against these systems of oppression. Debbie, I, I'll bring you on to, to give the last word here. I'm, I'm, we've talked a lot about uh, not only geographically, but historically, a different kinds of feminist internationalism. And um, I'd love to give you the floor to say a bit about what it means to you and, and what, if I can reiterate the, the question I put back to Osman as well, what kind of lessons do you feel like, you know, an organization like ours with the kinds of ambitions it has to be truly internationalist and truly planetary in scale and scope uh, might learn in terms of implementing a, a, a kind of feminist internationalism uh, as well? I believe you're muted, so let me try to unmute you. You've got to unmute yourself, it seems. I'll give it a moment. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, oh, you know, no. <laughs> thank you, by the way, for this opportunity. I know we're really nearing the end of our time. And you know what I what I want to just say, um, it, and I'll be very brief, is that when I was in Rojava, you know, one of the things I did was I asked them, sort of, what can we do to support you in your work? And over and over again, the most common answer that I got was, start in your own communities, please begin to create this to follow a sort of this assembly model of democracy start to get people to understand that politics has to be transformed. It has to become something that people do for themselves, you know, rather than something that's done to them by, by these, you know, these representatives in faraway places. And so like, I find leadership of women trying to do this actually all over the world now, as Meredith mentioned, you know, the, the women of the global South of Argentina, of Bolivia, the, tremendous strides they've made in horizontalism there and in organizing in their communities is, is extraordinary. And that mantle is being carried onward also by uh, women in the municipalist movements around the world. You know, I'm thinking of, and obviously under very different circumstances in very different places. I'm thinking, for example, of Salai Ghaffar of Afghanistan, who I had the honor of meeting a couple of years ago at a Kurdish women's conference. She's one of the most wanted women in the world by the Taliban, and yet she courageously travels all over Afghanistan and organizes women and empowers them to in turn organize and educate others in their community. And then in their various communities all around Afghanistan. And then there are people, you know, everybody from the, the great women of Barcelona and Camus who are really working to feminize politics and to articulate what a really feminized politics would mean. And, you know, people like Emily Clancy in Bologna, who's a young, very young, uh, city councilor there and who has really worked to tirelessly <laughs> oppose PD uh, efforts, the, the Partito Democratico in Bologna to develop the hell out of the city there. And so, you know, and, and even, for example, you know, right here in the United States where Symbiosis, which is a kind of a umbrella group for many uh, municipalist movements and is doing a lot of theoretical work and also organizing on the groundwork and where the women there are again and, and imparting a very feminist hue and non-hierarchical hue to their politics. So I see this as, as um, something that's really taking shape and growing throughout the world. I think that Progressive International it would be wonderful if people would embrace this idea of a sort of a third pole in the 
political debate, you know, between the streets and the state, this idea of organizing uh, and really institutionalizing our politics on the local level, starting to run people for city councils. Um, and a lot of this is happening in Europe, a lot more can happen and certainly should happen in the United States. But in my mind, these folks and, and this, or, this form of organizing are, are really the future. Thank you so much, Debbie. Uh, I mean, thank you all so much for your time. It's been a, a tremendous uh, hour and change with you. And I'm sure we could have gone on for much, much longer. But uh, I feel like between Meredith's you know, excellent contribution, which you can all find on our website, uh, and this wonderful forum, I've learned a lot about you know, the, the history and the status of, of the project in Rojava, as well as the urgency of all of us kind of getting involved uh, and showing our support and building exactly those kinds of utopian projects in our own communities. So it's my responsibility and my capacity as general coordinator to encourage you all to, to get involved with the PI, whether that's in making a regular contribution, just a two, three dollars, euros, pounds, yen, wherever you may be a month, or indeed becoming a member, starting to volunteer and getting involved in projects exactly like this that will enable us to get more organized at the international, uh, sorry, the, at the local level and, and build a kind of generation of internationalists that want to take forward this project. So. Thank you all very much for joining us here this evening, and I look forward to the next time that we can all be together. Take care.